You give Teller from Jerusalem 20 minutes, and he'll give you the education of a lifetime. King of the storytellers and the Shakespeare of the Torah world. Here is Rabbi Hanok Teller. Welcome to episode two of Teller from Jerusalem. I'm so happy you can join us again. Tell your friends, let's get everyone to come. We're all going to learn together. We left off last time talking about how Naftali Herzimber, an immigrant from Romania, made a poem with great pomp and circumstance about the little settlement of Rishon Zion of just 10 people when it looked like it was going to last. And that poem ended up becoming Israel's national anthem. I find it a bit far-fetched. Did you ever notice certain words in English sound like they're Yiddish, like far-fetched, far-flung, far away? That a poem which is read at a town meeting will then become the national anthem. But then again, what did America get out of the War of 1812? Don't forget, the War of 1812 was because the British had orders and council, which is a form of economic warfare which the Americans resented. Every American ship which would travel, no matter where the desti destination was, had to stop off in England and pay tax, deeply resented by the Americans. These orders were, were rescinded in 1812 before the war. But because this was a period before faxes and Twitter, America didn't know. The war was totally avoidable. It should not have happened. So what did America get out of this war? Considering the fact that, aside from the, la the lack of life and property, and the loss of life and property, and Washington being burned to the ground, and the borders did not move. So what did America get out of the War of 1812? <laughs> And just as the Star Spangled Banner gives people goosebumps when they hear it played at a baseball game, likewise Hatikva, Israel's national anthem, gives Israelis goosebumps, but surely not at a baseball game, when it's played. It's a very unusual anthem, Israel's anthem, because it doesn't mention a battle or a war. That's quite unusual. And nor does it mention the biblical tie of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. It became, though, very popular among Israelis, but somewhat opposed by religious Israelis. The line which is perhaps most uh, controversial is the line which says, to be a free people in our own land. That's fine. We want to be free and not shackled. But some understood this to mean to be free without any religious obligations. So Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik, he changed the words, to be a holy people within our land. In any event, Imber, the one who composed this poem, he died penniless in New York in 1909 from the effects of chronic alcoholism. And we continue. In September 1894, we could even entitle this, Never Trust Your Chambermaid. In 1894, a housekeeper, a maid in the German embassy in Paris, was going through the garbage, not because she was a very dutiful cleaner, but she was a spy for French intelligence. She was a plant. She was working there on behalf of French intelligence, and she would go through the garbage, and she saw a memo in the garbage that had all kinds of secrets of French artillery. She brought it right away to the Minister of War of France, and when he read this, he said, the only one who composed something with such intricate details of French artillery would have to be a captain in the artillery corps. He was given a list of old artillery officers and he concluded at once who the culprit was because almost all the officers were from aristocratic Catholic families, but one of them was a Jew. So therefore, duh, this guy must be the traitor. 
Now, Sherlock 101 would have concluded, or at least mandated, there should be some correlation between that which was written in this memo called Baudreau, Baudreau means a memo, between the handwriting and the Baudreau and the handwriting of the person who supposedly wrote it. Now, the captain who wrote this, his name was Alfred Dreyfus, and there is no correlation whatsoever, not a shred of connection between his handwriting and the Baudreau. So you could have concluded they didn't write it, but this minister of war of France, who clearly had the intelligence of an Ice Age vegetarian, concluded, well, he must be such a faker and trickster and dastardly Jew, he faked his handwriting not to look like his handwriting, so therefore it really is his handwriting, even though it doesn't look like his handwriting. So now... In 1899, Dreyfus was arrested and held for two weeks, and he did not confess to a crime that he had not commit. But then anti-Semitic newspaper, which was edited by an extraordinarily anti-Semitic individual, learned that Dreyfus was arrested, and he right away published that the Jew was a traitor, and all Jews were traitors. And this is right after the Prussian-Franco War, which, to the surprise of everyone, France lost. They were looking for some of the scapegoat, they had the perfect person. Here was the Jew who caused Germany to be victorious in the war, which everyone thought that France would win. They thought it would be a protracted war. It was a quick war, and Germany was victorious. And just like the French could not comprehend how could they have lost to Germany, the Germans have never comprehended how they could lose. Now, this war, the Prussian-Franco war, was the crowning achievement of Bismarck. Through this war, Bismarck was able to unite all of these countries to make one Germany. And from the time that Bismarck had united the country, Germany had never lost a battle. The Germans were convinced that Germany was invincible. And that's why the Germans could not comprehend how could it be that the invisible, pardon me, that the invincible German army, which had not lost a battle from the time Bismarck had united the country, how could it be that they could have lost World War I? And they never referred to World War I as a loss. They called it Sonnenbruch which means a collapse. There's an enemy from within which pulled out the carpet and Germany collapsed. That enemy from within, of course, was the Jew. And they referred to the Jew as Basli vermin. Basli vermin are parasites that suck the blood and take everything. The Jews had committed a dolstus, a stab in the back. Now, what do you do with Basli vermin? People tell me you kill them. People tell me you get rid of them. But the better would be you exterminate them. And that is self-preservation. They never referred to Jews as humans, because then what they're about to do is murder. If you refer to them as vermin, basli vermin, then what you're doing is self-preservation. And just like the Germans who were poor sports, what's a poor sport? A poor sport cannot understand how they could have lost the war. It must be that the referee cheated, or the umpire wasn't honest, or the other team cheated, or weather conditions, but they cannot own up to their own loss. So there's no way that Germany could have lost it must be there's an enemy from within. And just like Germany could not understand how their invincible army could have lost World War I, it was at Sananenbruch, likewise the French could not understand how could it be that they had lost to the Prussians and the Germans in the, Fra the Franco-Prussian War. There must have been a traitor within who was the scapegoat, Alfred Dreyfus. So the right-wing right press works overtime, vilifying the Jews in the most obscene ways. Dreyfus is convicted of spying, denounced as a traitor, and condemned to a lifetime of punishment on Devil's Island. Devil's Island is an island in the Caribbean surrounded by very, I mean, I was going to say very evil sharks, but I don't know a benevolent shark. And Devil's Island is going to become the most oppressive prison on the face of the earth. But before he is sent to Devil's Island, there is to be a parade of public humiliation. Now, there is a reporter covering this humiliation, but we have to go back to this reporter. He was born in Hungary, educated in Vienna. He was uh, exposed to many different accounts of anti-Semitism. In the University of Vienna, he encountered outright anti-Semitism, overt anti-Semitism by the students and also by the faculty. He read a book by a major European intellectual, Eugen Karl During, a very famous economist who wrote outrageous anti-Semitism. And he, this reporter came to the following conclusion. The reporter was actually a playwright, but he had to earn a living, so he becomes a, a reporter. He concluded 
that if Düring, who is an intellectual, can write such vilifying material, which is total nonsense, and be believed, then what can you expect from the unintelligent thugs? At that very same time, he was also influenced this playwright by a member of the Hungarian parliament, or as it was known, the Diet of Hungary. Personally, I'm always intrigued by the fact that the Hungarian parliament is called the Diet of Hungary. These two words don't really seem to go together, or they always seem to go together, the Diet of Hungary. And his name was Gyozo Istasi, or as I call him, Yo-Yo Idiot. He formed the National Anti-Semitic Party. That was actually its name, and it won 17 mandates. Try and imagine a party in America today being named the Anti-Black Party. It was an anti-Semitic party, and if that's their name, that's their business, and they have an agenda. In 1882, a teenage girl vanished, and the anti-Semitic Istasi and his party claimed right away that she had her head decapitated so that Jews could take her blood and make matzahs for ritual murder. Now, this accusation of ritual murder goes back to Norwich, England, to 1144. And time after time after time, they accused the Jews of having necessitated murdering a Christian child to draw their blood to bake their matzot to be eaten on Passover. From the 12th to 20th century, over 200 times, there'll be accusations of ritual murder, which will result in blood libels. And in every single instance, innocent Jews will be murdered and tortured and despoiled, pillaged and plundered, their possessions taken away, and countless deaths. This happens again and again. The fantasy of ritual murder is unusual and for two reasons. This is something which was brought to my attention by Rabbi Joseph Telushkin. Firstly, the Jews were the very first nation to outlaw human sacrifice. You'll find that in Genesis 22 and in Deuteronomy 18, verse 10. It was the only religion in the ancient Near East to prohibit the consumption of any blood. You cannot taste any blood. And the Torah exhorts again and 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 again not to consume blood. And I'm going to give you the sources. Leviticus 3.17, Leviticus 7.26, Leviticus 7.10 through 14, Deuteronomy 12.15-16, and Deuteronomy 12.23-25. Under no circumstance whatsoever may blood ever be consumed or tasted. And yet, and yet, this lie was so widespread in the Christian world that it led to an interesting irony. Now, how could they believe something which cannot be? Because if you believe someone, pardon me, if you hate someone, you can describe what they do in inhuman and even in anti-human terms. So it was Ahad Ha'am, one of the earliest Zionist thinkers, who posed the question, could it be that the entire world is wrong and only the Jews are right? And the answer is yes, it's possible. And the proof is the blood libel. The whole world is wrong and the Jews are right. Back to this Hungarian teenager, who was actually killed as a result of pedophilia. She was found in a river a week later with her head still attached. But still, it released violent anti-Semitism against the Jews. Tremendous numbers were tortured, victimized, and those that were accused of being guilty, even though there was no crime whatsoever, languished in prison for 15 months for no crime whatsoever. During this blood libel, Istazi proposed expulsion of all Jews resulting in violent acts and pogroms. So again, here's our reporter who was formerly a playwright. He's concluded, both in Hungary because of this act, and in Vienna where he encountered anti-Semitism, and he read the book of this intellectual. And then he sent to Paris to be a reporter. He's there at the time that Jewish financiers are underwriting the construction of the Panama Canal. It was done by Jewish financiers who were well connected in politics, and the French police accused them, pardon me, the French press accused them of bribery, corruption, and this reporter is struck by they've done nothing wrong, and yet these papers are saying that they're grinding the poor French people for their money so they can become riches on the back of the poor French. All these false characterizations turn the Jews into devils. This playwright wrote a play entitled The New Ghetto, and it's all about the fact that Jews are presumed to be 
guilty until they can be proven innocent. With this background, this reporter is now covering the Dreyfus trial. That's what brought him to Paris. Now, this individual, he is a person who is a bon vivant. He's very arrogant. He's charismatic. He's a cultured Germanic Jew, and he is strikingly handsome. Take a look at this guy, and maybe some of his arrogance could be understood. The name of the reporters, and the name of this reporter was Theodor Herzl. As he captures and covers the Dreyfus humiliation, and as Dreyfus brought out the parade of humiliation before the military academy of 500 jeering militaire de l'école of military uh, troops, and they yell, le mort de juif, death to the Jews, he sees his rank pulled off him. Epilepsy are emptied, the sword is cracked over the knee, buttons are thrown to the ground, and everyone begins to yell and shout, La mort le juif, death to the Jews. Dreyfus is expelled to prison on Devil's Island, and it's better years. I mean, post Dreyfus, prisoners who went to Devil's Island were shackled, they died from lack of food and lack of water, and they fell victims to vampire bats, army, army ants, and to rats. You didn't come out of there, if you came out, the way you went in. This was a tipping point for Herzl. He pondered what future could there be for Jews. Albert Dreyfus was an assimilated individual in an emancipated country. He didn't have any incentive to bribe, any incentive to take bribery, or any incentive to work for the Germans. He was well accomplished. He was independently wealthy. And Herzl noticed that wherever there was the emancipation, anti-Semitism caught fire. And so now, his conclusion is, we must find a solution for the Jews. It's just not going to work in Europe. And so that, therefore, his first solution was that the Jews should adopt Christianity. He then changed his opinion that the only hope for the Jews would be to have their own homeland. To achieve this goal, like every good cause requires financial backing. And Herzl is going to have to go and solicit money for his idea. The idea that Jews are not just a people and a religion, but a nation. And every nation needs their own homeland. Now what's going to happen is going to be one of the great flukes in history that's deserving at least of a footnote. Now you could pass right by this footnote in history, the fluke, if not for something that Daniel Gordis wrote, that Herzl's utter failure in meeting in a meeting led to his greatest success. Herzl goes to solicit money from Baron Maurice de Hirsch, a very successful French millionaire who was a philanthropist, and he tries to get Hirsch's uh, philanthropy to help the Zionist cause. Hirsch had contributed basically to everything. Hirsch was one of the five richest people in all of Europe. He was most famous because he had connected the Oriental Railway from Constantinople to Europe. And because of his skillful manager, managerial skills, he's able to oversee the railroad that should be profitable. The Ottomans, their strong suit is not skillful management. He also went into the sugar business and into the copper business, always turning a handsome profit. And as wealthy as he was, he was equally philanthropic and generous. He had many innovative projects. He had many communities in Argentina. I personally visited Porto Alegre in Brazil. These were communities that he set up so that people suffering from the Tsar's anti-Semitism could escape to the West. He made a community in South Jersey, South New Jersey, for chicken farmers. And some of these chicken farmers' sons were my, son, were my friends. That's in Norma, in uh, Vineland, Woodbine, New Jersey, and the cemetery in Woodbine is named after the Baron Hirsch's organization. Many people are familiar with the famous Baron Hirsch Synagogue in Memphis. He did many good things. And whenever one of his horses would, would, would win a race, he would donate all the proceeds to charity. And he would say that my horses run for charity. This reminds me of a story I once read that a rabbi was walking to synagogue on a Sunday morning, and his hat blew off, and he was running after the, after the, the hat, but he couldn't catch it. Ay, 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 ay. 
But Ananju saw what was going on, and he was in much better shape. He ran after the hat. He grabbed the hat. He brought it back to the rabbi, and the rabbi is so relieved. And so he was so grateful. He took out $20 from his pocket. He gave it to this non-Jewish fellow, and he said, thank you very much. Then he placed his hand on the non-Jew's head, and he gave him a blessing. And the non-Jew concluded, I have already $20, and I have already the rabbi's blessing. I might as well invest it. So he went to the horse races, and he came in on the fifth race. At that time, there was a, a horse called the Top Hat, where odds are 100 to 1 not to win. But he figured, listen, I have the rabbi's blessing, and I have $20. He put $20 down on Top Hat. And Top Hat came in five leads ahead of the closest race. He made $2,000. The boy came home and told his father, father said, you made $2,000? No. The story gets much better. Then what happened? So after I invested $20 into Top Hat, I saw that in the next race, in the sixth race, Stetson was running. Now, I don't know, but I don't know who Stetson is, but I know Stetson is a hat brand. So I figured I got the money from Top Hat, got the money from the Rabbi's Blessing, I'll put my money on Stetson. And the odds against Stetson were 30 to 1. But Stetson came in like a rocket, and I made $60,000. The father said, you made $60,000? Well, not exactly. What happened? So I figured I was doing so well, I might as well put money on the next race. In the seventh race, it was the clear favorite was Chateau. And I know Chateau means hat in French. So I put all my money on Chateau. And Chateau broke his leg and came in last. He said, you idiot. Chateau doesn't mean hat. Chapeau means hat. Who won the race? I don't know. It was some, some long shot from Japan called Yamaka. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for this episode. I hope to see you. Please make sure you subscribe and you share and you bring all your friends. We'd like to see them for our next episode. Thank you very much to all who have helped us. That means Eliezer running all the controls and Zephyr his ideas, Diana the Golden Voice, and Julie so much for the great name, Teller from Jerusalem. See you next time. Thanks for listening to Teller from Jerusalem, where this series takes an intelligent and thought-provoking look at the past in order to acquire a perspective on the present. Spread knowledge by giving us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe. Join us next time for a brand new episode and be sure to visit tellerfromjerusalem.com where you can find more details about the show and other useful information. Check out the site store and just by inserting the TFJ code, you'll receive an additional 10% discount off the already very reduced prices of all Hanoch Teller products, books, lectures, and documentaries. And remember, don't forget, you can get Teller from Jerusalem on any podcast platform or go to tellerfromjerusalem.com. Please see our YouTube channel for a richer than just audio experience with spiffy visual components and elements, also accessible from the Teller from Jerusalem website, where the list of general and specific credits are listed. <laughs>